So my name is Lee Blake, and I am the president of the New Bedford Historical Society. And with the Ruth Carter Show, I was one of the committee members and uh, worked with Jamie and others to come up with some of the themes and to make determinations on what costumes should be used. And Dolomite was my favorite. <laughs> I, I like Dolomite because I like that whole 1970s. That was a very impressionable time for me, but also in New Bedford. New Bedford has some really interesting history that folds and, and uh, encompasses the late 60s, early 70s. I was in high school, I was getting ready to actually go to college when New Bedford has a riot, and the riot in the west end of New Bedford. And it was so interesting because many of the pictures of that time, which is like 50 years ago, have really become available for us to see. They were not in the newspaper, so we wouldn't have seen it, but the uh, Standard Times gave the photographs to Spinner. There was a possibility of a restaurant opening in New Bedford that uh, they used all kinds of um, stereotypical imagery and we wanted to make sure that that didn't happen here. But it was like, well, it's going to happen in Dartmouth, so you know, you don't need to be so involved in it. But we wanted to be involved in it. We wanted to stop it because it was going to be by the mall, let's just say. So while it wasn't in New Bedford, it would have been something everyone saw. So people demonstrated against that very well. I don't think I'm in the photographs, but many of my friends are in the photographs. I'm in some other photographs. So photographs about the, the riots, I'm in some of those. My, as, a, as a 17, 18 year old young woman with a big giant fro. So, so I, I always say, so, just like they do now. Um, the riots started because the police were doing they were stopping people because people's taillights were out. There might have been some car issues. But one of the riots in the West End on Kempton Street really starts because the police stopped somebody because there was taillights out. And people rebelled against that. A lot of the stops were illegal, questionable. People were abused while those things were happening. But this time, there was a, a real reaction to that. And also the Black Panther Party was involved here. I was a, a member of the Black Panther Breakfast Party. I should say Breakfast Party, the Breakfast Project. And a lot of young women, you know, we had a commitment to kids, we had a commitment to education. So there were a lot of women at that time, my age group, who were involved in the Black Panther Breakfast Program. So there were more people and there was really a, a really good sense of, of rhetoric, of ideas, of vision. So we were able to communicate that, but also we weren't going to put up with all that crap as being stopped all the time. Unfortunately, what it did was that it riled up members of the white community, and they felt that they had a right to contain black people by driving down Kempton Street and shooting at people. And they did that, and young white men uh, shot a number of people who were just like on a Saturday night sitting out on the corner talking, and they killed one, and they shot three or four others. And that just, that just blew it all up. You know, it's a different time because the economics of the city were in rough shape, but, you know, people of color didn't have access to a lot of jobs, and when you complained, our mayor at the time wanted to clear the streets. He wanted to bring in the National Guard and just clear the streets of everybody. That like just wouldn't happen now. That just wouldn't happen. Of course, we got rid of him, but that's a whole other story. But at the time, I can remember the NAACP and some of the organizations going to the mayor and saying, we needed more representation on city council, in community organizations, people needed jobs. He didn't want to have anything to do with it. So the community went to the governor, and they invited the governor down. So at the time, that was Governor Sargent. 
And I remember all those things because that's where my pictures are. But also my mother was one of the people organizing, bringing the governor down, going over the head of the city council and the mayor who were just not taking the um, issues of the black community in, in any credible way. So we just went right to the governor. And we went to Senator Brooke at the time, who was like the only black Republican senator um, in Congress. And we brought them down to see what was going on. So back to the show. You have this whole historical piece. And of course, I'm a historian. So you have this whole historical piece. But you also have this wonderful Dolomite film, which goes right to a whole period of time where black people were kind of reclaiming their Im images and they were looking for people like Shaft, people who looked good, people who um, were in, in some ways the voice of the oppressed, but also they were images of change and they weren't gonna take shit anymore, that they were gonna stand up. So even though Dolomite is a comedy, what he's doing is reframing the way that black people are being seen in, in film. And of course, Ruth is doing all the great costumes. Everybody had those great suits, the pants suits, the matching colors at that time. I don't think they're over the top because, of course, I saw much more outrageous. Plus, people had, pla the guys had platforms, you know, besides the fact that their suits were in color and their suits were, um, in different kinds of prints and everything, I, I wouldn't say that they were over the top. You know, all, everybody had these big giant afros and um, the colors, the images. I think she did a good job. You know, kids can't learn if they're hungry. I mean, it's real simple. And if you have a community that has some economic needs and uh, people and their families are not earning a lot of money. There are certain ways that you can work with them. Food insecurity is a big issue now. You know, we just went through this whole thing with the pandemic where people didn't have money to buy food. So back in the, the 70s, that was a big issue. So what the Panthers did was they organized community breakfast programs so that young people got cereal and, and juice and they got fruit before they went to school. They also had a component where, you know, they got snacks after school, but at the same time that they were providing food, they would talk to kids, they would read to kids. So it's part of the educational issue that the Panthers did. But of course now everybody does breakfast programs. Um, I worked in New York for a number of years as, as a director of education for the city of New York. We had breakfast programs, we had lunch programs, after school programs, and evening programs that fed people in all the public schools. Because people understand that's one way of helping with food insecurity. Of course, yesterday was a, a banner day for the whole country because President Biden put together this whole plan where people were getting $250 or $300 per child. So that's shoes, that's diapers, that's food. Those are the kinds of things that we've, we thought about and dreamed about 50 years ago. 50 years ago, that's 1970, 50 years ago. But it's so wonderful to see that and, and to see the reaction of parents who talked about recently in the, the interviews these past few days, what that kind of money means. It's not a lot of money. You know, while, while we have big businesses that aren't paying any taxes. So I, I began working with the Art Museum actually when it was Artworks. I was a, a, one of the board of directors and uh, worked with Irene Buck but, and Noel actually. I, I've had a, um, a very fruitful relationship there are times when the historical society has come up with an idea for an exhibit. And you know we've gone to Jamie, we've gone to whoever the executive director was at the time, or we might have met an artist that hadn't exhibited in the area. So we would bring that information here and see if we couldn't work the idea up. So I, I have a few favorites, 
But one of my favorites, again, relates to, as a historian, giving young people an opportunity to see protest art. So we worked on a social, uh, a social movement art exhibit. And what we did was, we knew all these people that had fabulous framed posters. So we went to everybody and we said, you know, can we borrow your posters? Can we put it in the art museum? And can we do some workshops on the, the movements that you were involved in, where you got these posters from? You know, I have posters that go back to, ooh, the 1980s, late 1990s, 1970s, uh, and framed, they're framed. So I know I have that, and there were a lot of other people that have poster collections. So for them, it was an honor to be able to put their posters in a show that, I don't know, what do we have, like 35, 40 posters? from people around here who were activists, who were advocates for certain areas, people who were involved in the women's movement, the black movement, the Cape Verdean movement, the Cape Verdean liberation movement. They were all putting their posters here. And then we had a series of, of talks on those, including one on South Africa. So that was really cool. And I, I like to tell people, it didn't cost a lot of money because people's pictures were framed already. And um, you know we get to do a couple of receptions, people are wandering around and looking at their art and having conversations about what these pieces meant to them and what kind of activities they were involved when they collected these posters. So the Nebefford Historical Society will be 25 years old, September, October. So we are looking for Oh, some ideas on how to celebrate that. But what I can tell you, the impact the historical society has had. Many of us lived in the city, went away to college, and there are certain things that we learned about the history of New Bedford, the black history, the Cape Verdean history, Native American history, that no one else was telling. So. We're in our 50s after going away, we come back home, our uh, nephews and nieces really aren't learning anything about the history of people of color in New Bedford. And we have organizations that quote unquote do that, but really that's not what they do. They are, they really talk about white history. They don't talk about integrated history, multicultural history. So we had some real visionaries who you know, founded an organization. And it was so interesting to me that people did not choose to be the New Bedford Historical Society. They wanted to be the Dartmouth or the Marion. Because why? Because that's where the white community lives. That's why. And they didn't want to say, we're the inner city, black, Cape Verdean, Latino community. They didn't want to do that. So that's why they chose that. So we used to call them on that and say, you know, New Bedford has an amazing history. And, you know, we have done the history of the Underground Railroad, the abolitionist movement, the uh, movement to bring more immigrants of color to New Bedford, the Cape Verdean immigrants, and also talked about, you know, this is all Native American land. What was happening here? And of course, King Philip's War, you know, I can go back and talk about the, the 17th century, but when the pilgrims came to this area, you know, a lot of the Wampanoag Indian villages were empty because they were dead. People brought germs. You know, the, the English weren't necessarily very clean, and their germs infected all those people, and those people died. So, of course, there was land because they'd been wiped out. This is a genocide. Um, so anyway, of course, yeah, oh, yeah, sure, there was land. Um, but who was telling those stories? You know, who was telling the stories of the anti-slavery movement in New Bedford? New Bedford was a welcoming place for people who were uh, runaways and people who uh, were freedom seekers. And the community here in New Bedford, the black community, was very well off. The white community, of course, because of whaling, 
people had money, but they also had uh, a sense that slavery was wrong. And not everybody felt that way, but the vast majority of people here in the city felt that way. So that's what we captured. So the historical society captured that. Um, and the other thing is you have to raise the visibility. If people forget over 100 years your history, how do you kind of grab on to anniversaries, take historical characters and reimagine them, but also bring them up and amplify their voices. So for instance, not that many people knew that Frederick Douglass used to live in New Bedford, that he and his wife, Anna, when they run away and, and leave Maryland, this is where they come and they live here for four or five years and their first three children are all born here. But that's only one. There are lots of people who were abolitionists, who were um, freedom seekers, who had been formerly enslaved that come to New Bedford. They work on the docks, they work on the ships. That's a very important part of our whaling history and it had just been totally ignored. So we get to celebrate that. Well, I think it's important for Ruth to be here. I can't see that she's had many shows. Um, of course, she just won many awards recently. But she, you know, she's a hometown girl in terms of, of Massachusetts. And for, for many of us, she went through her school career and never heard some of these people. You know, she didn't know that, you know, Frederick Douglass lived in Massachusetts. He lived in a lot of cities in Massachusetts. That there were other abolitionists who were very active in her hometown of Springfield. That uh, some of the routes to the Underground Railroad go in that direction in order to leave the state and go to Canada. Those are a points of pride for young people and for, for all of us. But if you think that your, your personal history doesn't encompass any of the movements in the United States history, you know, you know people talk about, they talk about the uh, 1776 and the Constitution. We have to look at how we were impacted by that. And you have to talk about that and you have to raise the visibility and at the same time, not allow people to diminish the impact that people of color had on history. So it's, in, in many ways, it's exciting because, you know, my background, I used to teach New Bedford High School. I taught black studies in New Bedford High School. And young people would come up to me and say, I had no idea, I don't know anything about this. How can I read? And the library, and I'm not talking about the public library, the school libraries didn't have any books for them. So I would go out, at, and I was laughing, um, looking at Carl's exhibit, I would go to Salt Marshes and I would buy any secondhand books on black people and people of color, and I would put it in the library at the public school. And then I would assign book reports. So how do you assign book reports on people of color if your school libraries don't have any books. And young people want to know those things. At that time, young people really wanted to know because they were watching Dolomite movies and Shaft movies. So they wanted to know those things and that's when I was teaching. But they want to know them now because of social justice movements. They want to know how people in this country moved the country passed some of the, um, you know, the Southern racism that went on until 1963. You know, how did people get the right to vote? What did they have to do? And what do we have to do now to keep the right of vote? So those are the things that, that people want to learn. You know, the, um, I'm always, as I teach the abolitionist movement, and young people say, well, you know, the abolition move, slavery is over. And I said, yes, but the abolition movement is the movement that started all the other social movements that we have. So the movements for uh, gay rights, the movements for senior rights, the, the gray movement, the movement for the women's movement, all those things were started by the abolitionist movement. And it spread out because 
things were so wrong in, in the 1850s and 60s, and of course we had a civil war, but at the same point in time, the civil war doesn't end. Women still didn't have the vote until 1920. Native Americans didn't have the vote almost until 1930. So you have to continue, continuously fight for those things. And the background of the abolitionist movement helps for people to understand that it's winnable, it's doable. I think you could look at Polly Johnson. Um, you know, there were, there were a number of women's organizations at the time, so the abolitionist movement, you, you have the male movement, the anti-slavery movement, anti-slavery society was mostly male, but the women had ladies, like ladies' guilds, and um, I, I have to say that the, um, oh dear, the Sea Glass Theater in New Bedford is getting ready to do an opera based on women who stayed here while their husbands went out whaling, but while they were here, they put together schools, they put together social services for families, because those things didn't exist. And one of the things that they'll be doing is focusing on the anti-slavery movement and how women would have anti-slavery fairs. You would, as a, as a woman, you know, you'd knit, you'd do, you'd collect autographs. Um, you would figure out ways to raise money. And then on January 1st, New Bedford has this big anti-slavery fair where the women sell all these goods and services. They take the money. And what's the money used for? The money's used for the liberation, the liberator newsletter, but it's also used to buy people's freedom. So in those days, you know, if you were a pretty girl of color, they didn't make you work in the fields all the time. Uh, 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 you know, next thing you know, sexual trafficking. So women's groups would pull money together to save young girls. And they, you know, it makes me cry sometimes. Because we don't, those are things we don't know. People, when I do tours of the Johnson House, People say, gee, I never thought that women were really involved in the Underground Railroad. They said, people don't talk about it. But women organized, they did all their little household domestic chores, they would have a fair, New Bedford has one, Boston had one every other year, and they would raise money and they would save people's lives with that money. So your little brownies at the time, your little brownies and your knitting, you know, might save a young girl from being a prostitute. You've ever had a really interesting history. <laughs> so when Sea Glass Theater does their play, it'll be out October 2nd. They've been working on it for a while. So there'll be three New Bedford women in there who talk about this whole way that women were actively involved in you know, keeping the economy going, keeping their families going while their men are out to sea, but also being involved in the anti-slavery movement. So, with all these stories, we have this wonderful opportunity. The Historical Society bought the land across the street from the Nathan and Polly Johnson house, which was just a lot. And you know, there were a lot of rumors that uh, they were gonna make it into a parking lot. But we were able to purchase that land and it will become a new park, but it'll be a historical park. And it will tell the story of the people that lived on 7th Street and 6th Street, many of whom were abolitionists. It'll tell the story of people like Henry Box Brown, who came to New Bedford in a box, who becomes a, a national and international figure, telling his story of being enslaved around the world. And of course, Frederick Douglass lived across the street from the park, and the park will have a statue of Frederick Douglass. So it is. It's an opportunity to tell a story about New Bedford and about New Bedford's people of color because we want young people to learn these things. You know, we've been uh, very involved in the mural projects in the city, working with different artists. We did the 54th mural. Who would know? You know, you, if you don't spend time telling young people about these things. It's not like they're learning these things in school. And there's a whole reason for that. 
I, I don't want to blame the schools, but I will certainly blame MCAST for stopping the opportunity for extracurricular activities for young people. But part of the way that we do our work is besides telling the stories and lectures, is we do public art. So doing an exhibit here, doing the Ruth Carter show, doing the Obama show, which was just phenomenal, and being a partner in those things, and doing visual work with statues and with murals around the city, that's how we tell our story. And to see young people stand in front of these pieces of art with their mouths open and saying, who are these people? I want to know who these people are, because they're not going to get it in a book, unfortunately. <laughs>